go. So, um, well, thanks for having another coffee with cardiology. So, I thought it would be useful to talk a little bit about um, some of the numbers that, as we're rounding and thinking about patients, that we calculate in our heads um, that help us determine physiologic state. And a lot of these come because when most cardiologists, we train in the cath lab, so we think about numbers differently. And so we think about them more as what the numbers mean, and, and we're doing kind of calculations on the fly. Uh, but I don't think you guys necessarily think about the numbers like that because you have never been in the cath lab, so you don't see how we get them. So I thought it would be worthwhile just talking about how we think about shunts and when we talk about what pulmonary overcirculation is, what that means to us, and when we talk about heart failure, what that means, and all these different numbers. So one of the things you'll hear us talking a lot about is QPQS. So does anybody know what, when we say QPQS, what we're talking about? Mm -hmm. So basically QPQS are fancy abbreviations for QP is the flow to your pulmonary vascular bed, okay? So pulmonary blood flow is QP, and QS is your systemic blood flow, mm -hmm. okay? So in most of you with normal hearts, right, you have two circulations that are in parallel, right? The right side of your heart that's going to your pulmonary arteries, and the left side of your heart that's going to your aorta. And basically, for every one part of blood that goes on one circulation, that same part of blood goes to the other circulation. So the amount of blood that's going to your lungs and that's going to your body is the same. And so that ratio is one to one. Okay. So when we think about, when we're talking about QP to QS and what's high and what's low, that tells us, gives you a lot of physiologic information about where blood flow is going and really helps us understand what, what's happening. So when I say this kid has, let's just talk about like a Norwood. So a kid with a you know, fresh out of the box Norwood, or not Norwood, hypoplast, fresh out of the box, um, we were saying, oh, they're pulmonary, they have pulmonary overcirculation, so let's start them on Norwood. So if I say pulmonary overcirculation, Tip, what does that mean to you? Uh, too much flow to their lungs, too much right. blood. Well. So if you had to do that equation, is that, do they have too much QP or too much QS? QP. QP. So their QP to QS, the ratio, is greater than one to one. Okay. So when we say pulmonary overcirculation, in our minds we're saying QP to QS more than one to one. Okay. It's the same thing when we talk about heart failure. Okay. When someone's in heart failure, it's not like an adult medicine. When, they, when adults talk about heart failure, they talk about really pump failure, right? It's really failure of the pump. When we talk about heart failure, we talk about the constellation of symptoms that make up heart failure. Tachycardia, tachypnea, hepatomegaly failure to thrive. Okay. So but what does that mean? What that really means is that you have, in our patient population, it's usually not pump failure, it's usually too much pulmonary blood flow, okay? So a classic example of somebody who is in heart failure is a person with a big VSD, okay? So in a big VSD, where does the blood usually go from? Does it go from the right ventricle to the left ventricle or left ventricle to the right ventricle? Left to right. Left to right. Left to right. And why does it go that way? Pressures. Higher pressures. Pressure where? It's lower higher pressure on the, on the right, yeah. So it's higher pressure on the left, but what actually drives the flow? Because remember, when your ventricle is pumping, right? So what's, if it just, let's just look at the left ventricle. So why does blood ever leave your left ventricle? So you're squeezing, Squeeze. right? So what squeezing generates is pressure. What your blood sees is what's downstream, okay? So your blood doesn't know any different. So as it's building pressure, it has a choice. It could either stay where it is, go backwards across the mitral valve or go forwards across the pulmonary the aortic valve and it goes to where there's basically less resistance mm -hmm. and in this case less pressure. Mm -hmm. So when your heart's pumping and you have a big VSD, the reason why your blood goes from your left ventricle to your out to your right ventricle and your outflow is not because of the right ventricular pressure, it's because what it sees out that hole. It looks out the hole and what does it see there? The pulmonary artery, which has even less resistance than your aorta. So that's why the blood goes across your VSD and out your Okay, so it's a left to right shunting lesion. So left to right shunting lesion, you get more pulmonary blood flow. More pulmonary blood flow is the same thing we talk about in, in hypoplast, their pulmonary overcirculation, so their QP to QS is more than one to one. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is gonna be a common theme. So anyone that we talk about heart failure and pulmonary overcirculation, we talk about QP to QS as more than one to one. Okay, now if you take the opposite side, let's look at a patient with tetralogy of flow, okay? So patients with tetralogy flow, okay, blood comes back to the right side of their heart, sitting in the right ventricle. Now it has a choice, right? It can go out the pulmonary artery, but that's usually stenotic, or it can go out across the VSD. 
So now, which where's the less resistance? On the PA or across the VSD? Across Usually, the it's VSD. across the VSD. So what happens is that that blood comes in, goes across the VSD, and makes them what color? Blue. Blue. blue right. Most tents are blue. So now we have more blood flow going from right to left, and now you have more pulmonary blood flow or more systemic blood flow. More systemic. More systemic. Okay. So remember that ratio. QP is going down, QS is going up. So now your ratio is less than one to one, and they're blue. Mm -hmm. So that's a very important message. So if you're blue, your QP to QS is less than one to one. If you're too pink and you're in heart failure, your QP to QS is more than one to one. So it's not ever quantified as just like number wise. It's always just more than or less than. So in the cath lab, we actually measure it. Okay, and so in, this is what I'm going to uh, teach you guys to do at the bedside. So what the, there's really four numbers that you need to calculate QP and QS. Okay, there's lots of parts of the equation, but they all drop out of the equation when you do the math. So there's only really four numbers you need. You need what your, your mixed venous saturation is. And so when we talk about mixed venous saturations, we're usually talking about your SVC. That's typically your mixed venous saturation. It's all the blood coming back to your heart after it's lost all of its oxygen. That's as mixed as it's going to be. Okay, that's your SVC. Then you need your systemic arterial saturation, which is your aorta. Okay, so those are usually the two easiest ones to get because you have an aortic sat, and often we have some measure your SVC. So we sometimes have an SVC line. Sometimes we have lower extremity lines. Those aren't as good. Really, IJ is the best. And what do we have on a lot of kids now that's a good estimate is NEARS. So NEARS is actually a basically um, a good way to estimate what your mixed venous saturation is, okay? So using your your SVC saturation, your aortic saturation, you actually know what your that the systemic blood flow part of the calculation is. On the pulmonary side, you need two numbers. You need what's coming back from your lungs, which is your pulmonary vein sats, which we usually assume to be normal. Okay, so we assume that most kids have normal, like 100%. Now, we all know that that's not true in most of our kids. So sometimes you have to fudge it a little bit. You say, yeah, but they're really wet, so it's probably not 100, it's probably 90, so here's a little fudge factor in there. Then the other sat you will need is your pulmonary artery sat, which we usually don't measure, right? So we usually don't have a line in people's pulmonary arteries, and even if we do, we're not we're drawing sats off them. So then you have to make some assumptions. In all of you, if I measured your SVC set and your pulmonary artery set, they're the same. Because all the blood coming back to your heart goes out to your pulmonary arteries. It hasn't picked up or lost any oxygen, so it's the same. But in our kids, it's much different. So in a shunted patient, so in a hypoplast who has a shunt, okay, all the blood that's going to the lungs comes from where? The shunt. From the shunt, which is connected to your aorta, right? Mm -hmm. So your saturations have to be the same. So in their, those patients, it's actually very easy because there's only one place the blood's coming from, from your aorta. So their pulmonary artery set is the same as their aorta, okay? So if you have those four numbers, you can actually calculate QP to QS. In the, when we do the math, it's a little bit funny how it is with the way that ratio is, but it's basically your systemic numbers over your pulmonary numbers, okay? So if I took my numbers, so my systemic numbers, my, I'm hoping my aortic set's about 100%. <laughs> My SVC set's about 75%, so the difference there is 25, okay? My, um, then I go down to the bottom part of the equation, my pulmonary saturations. My blood coming back to my pulmonary veins, 100%, and the blood in my pulmonary artery is 75%. So it's 25 over 25, one to one, mm -hmm. okay? So that's why I'm nice and pink and happy and I'm not <laughs> okay? So let's, let's take our example of the kid with the big VSD, okay? So in the big VSD, you have your pulmonary vein, let's just do the top part of the equation again, okay? What are, what's their aortic set usually? Like a normal VSD is just sitting on 100, right? So it's usually 100. What's their SVC saturation? It's gonna be the 75. same, right? So it's still 75, so 25 on top. The bottom part, it's 100% coming back from the lungs. Okay. But what's their PAs? Is it 75 or is it higher or lower? Depends on. So remember the blood that's pink that's in the left ventricle it's probably lower. going across. No. It's actually higher no, because it's blood shunting. Left ventricle yeah. going across the hole and out to the pulmonary artery. So you get higher sats yeah. now in your pulmonary artery. Yeah. So it's a stats. It's a sat step up. So now you have 25 over 100 minus let's say it's 90. So 25 over 10. 10. Mm -hmm. Now you have a QP to QS of 2.5 to 1. So that's how we actually calculate these numbers. So you don't have many of these. You know, we calculate this all in the cath lab all the time, but you don't have this at the bedside, so what you have to do is basically infer. So that's why NEARS is so helpful, because 
not only does it give you a sense of how you're extracting oxygen, and I think you said Gabe had probably talked about mirrors in the past, mm -hmm. um, and we could talk about that more if you want, but it gives us some assessment of basically what that mixed venous saturation is. The aortic saturation is easy, right? We have that on everybody. The pulmonary vein is a little bit tricky, especially in kids with lung disease, and then the pulmonary artery, you have to sometimes make some assumptions. But that's how when, we, when we're sitting at the bedside and we're talking about, you'll hear us talk to the fellows about this. We said, you know, what's their physiological state? You know, are they over-circulated? Are they too blue? Where's their balance? There's a lot of kids that look like they have, they're pretty well balanced, and when you actually think about them, they're really over-circulated. What I think is the most impressive thing about our patients, it's amazing that anybody actually survives. So if you take a, a, a kid who's a Norwood, okay, straight out of the box Norwood, when you actually do their math, their QP to QS is usually about three to one, okay? So they're very, they're very generally pretty big, like 90%, but remember only one ventricle is doing all that work. Mm -hmm. So what that means, when you think about what two to one, three to one, what these numbers mean, okay? So again, one to one. So one cardiac output, on one side, one goes on the other side. So when you think about a two to one or a three to one shunt, okay, that means that you have one chamber that has to do a three times your circulation, one that has to do one. So you have four cardiac outputs, you only have one ventricle. So your that ventricle is doing four cardiac outputs, okay? For every beat, it's doing the amount, four times the amount of work that your left ventricle or right ventricle is doing. It's pretty incredible when you take into account the fact that these are little hearts that only have one ventricle, and by the way, have very small aortas that don't have very good coronary blood flow, it's kind of amazing that all these kids aren't dying like right away. So the numbers really mean something when you step back and think about it, but I think it's useful to think about these when you're around it, when you're thinking about your kids. So you have a kid down here, and for instance, we have a kid right now with a pulmonary artery band on. Okay, so why do we put a pulmonary artery band? Why, like that, what's the, what's the idea? So this guy has a big VSD, so they have too much pulmonary blood flow. So what does the band do? It slows it down. Restricts, right? So yeah. basically now when you're in that blood cell in the left ventricle and you're looking out the hole, you say, I could either go to the aorta, go to the PA, but there's that band there that's restricting the flow. So it encourages more blood to stay on the left side of the heart. Mm -hmm. So you're basically just trying to rebalance their QP to QS, okay? And take them from having a 3 to 1 shunt down to a 1 to 1 shunt or something close there too. Mm -hmm. Now you put the band on super duper tight, now you're more like a 10, yeah. right? Because now you're in the right ventricle and you're like, well, now I can't even go out the pulmonary artery, so I'll just go that way out the VSD, and then they're blue. Mm -hmm. So that's why banding in that situation, you know, is kind of a hard thing to do because you're trying to band to balance their circulations a little bit. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. More or less? Yep. All right, so let's talk about another thing that we see a lot of. So hemifontans, okay? So hemifontans are usually blue or pink. When we actually measure hemifontans, their QP to QS in the cath lab, they tend to be less than one to one. They tend to be more like 0.8 to one. Okay, so they're a little bit on the bluer side. What about a fontan? Fontan's blue or pink? Pinker. 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 So fontans, the perfect fontan actually has about a one to one. Because what you've done is you've taken that one ventricle, it's doing all the systemic output, and everything is just coming back passively to your pulmonary arteries. And so when you actually do the math, they turn out to be about one to one. Okay, so the good fontans are about one to one. Okay. Yeah, on fenestration leaks and all that other stuff, things get a little bit muddy, but that's so that, that's what we think about for shunts. So does this make sense? I know this is kind of a weird concept, but I think it's useful to get in the minds of when, when the fellows are talking about things or the attendees are talking about things, what are they actually thinking about? Because um, it does change what we do. So you have a kid who's over-circulated, too much blood flow go to the lungs. How are you going to treat that? Like an so, no, so what does milrinone do? Yeah, so ACE inhibitor milrinone. What does milrinone and ACE inhibitor do? Lowers the systemic blood pressure. So it lowers step. How does it do that? It that's makes right. the heart more pliable. It makes it... Not the heart. Well, it does. Uh, well, that's a complex thing. So yes, it does improve your diastolic relaxation of your heart. So it does help with function. But what else does it do? Like what happens? Vasodilates. Vasodilates. Have so it decreases doctor. your systemic vascular resistance. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when you put someone on milrinone, now you're trying to basically encourage blood to go away from that low pressure pulmonary bed to this nice new low pressure, low resistance mass, systemic vascular bed. Okay? How does nitric oxide work? So we have these kids, all these pink when we put them on nitric oxide. How does that work? So what does the oxygen do to your to your blood supply? Why do we get why do we put kids with pulmonary hypertension on oxygen? Because it relaxes. 
right? Relaxes what? Pulmonary. pulmonary. Right. So oxygen actually lowers your pulmonary vascular resistance. It also increases your systemic vascular resistance. So most people don't know that. So we put someone on on subambient oxygen. Okay. So lower than room air. What are we trying to do? We're actually trying to drive up their pulmonary vascular resistance. So that again, you're encouraging more blood flow to go to the systemic vascular bed. So those, that's why milrinone, subambient oxygen work when you're trying to balance the circulation in a, in a hypoplastic baby, okay? What about nitric oxide? What does nitric oxide do? Say again, you're... you're right, exactly. So, so nitric oxide is a pulmonary vasodilator, okay? It's actually a smooth muscle dilator. It's the same way that sildenafil works. It's why it works for uh, for erectile dysfunction. It's a smooth muscle vasodilator, okay, which is all what your lungs are made of. So it's doing the same thing. So it gives pulmonary hypertension. You're trying to basically relax their muscular bed. And so that's why when we think about the medicines, that's why those medicines work. Why do we give kids diuretics? Okay. What do diuretics do? Make you pee. Make you pee. So why, like, what, what's that useful for? So it doesn't usually decrease a lot of the volume because most of the most of the flu the fluid we're talking about is extravascular volume. It's usually that third spaced, you know, volume around the lungs and the liver and things like that. But what does it do? So when you have too much pulmonary blood flow, what happens when you get pulmonary edema? Okay. When you get pulmonary edema, what happens? Your oxygen Decreases. levels start to go down because now you have your instead of your pulmonary veins being 100% saturated, they come back 90% saturated. So that's why we're so, when we're talking about kids in the post-operative period that are blue, that's why we're doing things like trying to remove any fluid with chest tubes, giving kids diuretics to try to lower, uh, make their lungs healthier so that they get basically better oxygen exchange. Okay, so diuretics actually have nothing to do with what your balance is. It really is just treating the symptoms of your QPD, QS. Okay, that makes sense? Yeah. Okay. So the kid that's on melanoma and nitric. Now you said they both work in different for different. Right. Uh, what's the what's the you don't have to tell me the name. Wrong, can't that's a it's a hemi. Okay. Or so. Glenn. Glenn. Okay. So why would why do you think melanoma melanoma might be a good medicine? Can we just throw everything at him? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> No, that's great. <laughs> they didn't give a reason. They didn't. Uh, we talked about it, but they were just, let's try this and this and yeah. this and this. So, so they, something worked, but we don't know which one. Okay, so this kid was blue or he was very blue. Very blue, yeah. Okay. So what does, um, why would Milrinone maybe make you less blue? Well, his, he has poor RV function. Okay. They're severe, so. Yeah, so what happens, let's, let's we got to work through this. This is kind of complex. So if you have bad RV function, Okay, so your right ventricle is sitting down here. What has to flow into your right ventricle passively to make you not blue? Okay, pulmonary blood flow, right? Yeah. So pulmonary blood flow is coming back passively from your SVC into your pulmonary arteries. It goes to your pulmonary arteries because it goes, it has to, the resistance bed that has to go across is number one, it has to go across your pulmonary vascular bed, and then past that it has to see what your ventricle is doing, right? So as your function goes down, your end diastolic pressure goes up, so your resistance to flow goes up. So if you have bad function, putting someone on milrinone, which helps with that diastolic relaxation and lowers your systemic vascular resistance, mm -hmm. makes your ventricle work better, and basically lowers the, that resistance part. Now there's another part in that resistor, which is the Lungs. pulmonary vascular bed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's why the combination of nitric and milrinone would make sense, because you're basically trying to lower all the resistors along that pathway on the way down. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, you know, in, in our hearts, there's lots of places where we have resistance, right? There's our valves. Um, there is our systemic and pulmonary vascular beds. If you have pulmonary artery stenosis or a coart, and uh, the one that everybody forgets about is your ventricles. Okay, those, that's what, blood coming back from the right side of your heart, that's what that's seeing. So as it's coming back from your IVC and SVC, and it's looking in, has to look in that valve, what is it looking at? It's actually looking at that end diastolic pressure. So as your heart's as relaxed as it's going to get, that's what it has to flow into. So as your function gets bad in your heart, then your diastolic pressures go up, your filling pressures go up. And that's why we see in like TETs. So when TETs come back from the operating room, they have these really thick, stiff ventricles. 
so their central venous pressures are high, mm -hmm. and they don't like to not have high central venous pressures, because mm -hmm. if you don't have if you don't have the filling pressure to fill it, the blood looks in there and says, well, I'm I'm not going to go in there, and so what happens? Then you go into low cardiac output, mm -hmm. and you have low blood pressure. So you want to give them fluid. Now you also, in those patients, have to give them fluid slowly, because we all know what happens if you slam in a bolus to a very pressure stiff drops. ventricle, yeah. it just stops, mm -hmm. and then you have a problem. So. So that's why the end diastolic pressure is actually a very important number when we, because it's one of the, it's the one resistance part of your circulation that we don't really think too much about. It's also the part we don't have a lot of good medicines for. Okay, so milrinone is pretty good at that diastolic part. We don't really have great ones on the right side of the heart. So uh, we often will use milrinone. It probably has some effects, but it's uh, you know it's we don't have great treatments for diastolic heart failure. This is why kids who have um, cardiomyopathies are so sick mm -hmm. because you can help help their hearts squeeze but we don't have a lot of things to help their hearts relax and so that's usually what gets them into a lot of trouble is these very high filling pressures the, the classic example of this is restrictive cardiomyopathy mm -hmm. what restrictive cardiomyopathy is in essence is basically diastolic failure of your heart your heart cannot relax because it gets all stiff and then everything goes to hell after that so that's and it's really hard to treat because there's not a lot of things to make your heart relax well, other than milk. Okay. Does this make sense? I, yeah, yeah. I know this is a confusing thing, but yeah. when we think about numbers, and you'll hear us talking about it to the fellows all the time, because this is what we teach, we preach to the fellows, is knowing your QP to QS, understanding are you too blue, too pink, where on the, on the kind of spectrum are you, and always trying to get back to that one-to-one -one balance of circulations. And actually, the one-to-one -one balance is great as a Fontan. You don't want to be one-to-one -one as, a, as a Norwood. Have a problem actually. So, so most Norwoods are not one to one. They're usually closer to about one and a half to two to one. I'm surprised we don't have a medicine to make the heart relax more. It's like Milrone's our only shot. So there is another medicine, um, which is now is escaping my mind. Because essentially, the heart's a muscle. You think that we could find something? Right, right. something to yeah. right. So there is. Oh my god. So there's a medicine that we do not have in the United States. <laughs> But they do have in other parts of the world, which is basically a pure uh, lusotropic agent, which means that only if all it does is help your heart relax. It doesn't help it contract at all, but it helps it relax incredibly well. And it's a great medicine, and we would love to get it, but we can't. So we were just talking, we were just talking about this probably in the last couple months with Reg, if we were any closer to getting this back. I'll, when I think of it, I'll, I'll come back and tape it. But it's, uh, <laughs> Yay! But it's, um, it's a really a purely a pure muscle uh, medicine that's really purely help, meant to help the heart relax. The, the hard part about muscle relaxation with, um, with cardiac muscle, so relaxation is actually an active process. So you think about it just relaxing like, uh-huh. It's actually an active process. It involves decoupling of the muscle fibers, which takes um, basically calcium and energy to do. And so you need, it, it, you need medicines to basically help the heart uncouple in a normal way. You don't want it to totally uncouple, but you need it to uncouple in a controlled way to get more relaxation. Okay? Make sense? Okay. So NEARS quickly. Did anybody have a question about NEARS? I brought it up quickly. I, I want to make sure everybody had, didn't have any questions on it. I, I think you should. What numbers are we looking for? when we're looking at the NEARS then, so, when you're looking at the, these? So um, NEARS are, so again, NEARS are basically a estimate of what your, your mixed venous saturation is at that local level, okay? And that's important. So what we, in the cath lab, we always look at the SVC, but we don't have like uh, SVC NEARS. So we usually use cerebral or mesenteric NEARS, but it's only telling you what the oxygen level is at the capillary bed at that spot, okay? So that's important just when you're thinking about where they are. So, in an ideal world, if you put it on, all of us, it would be about 70, 75. That's what normally, if you think about blood coming back from your body, is usually about 75-ish percent. Mm -hmm. The reality is that NEARs are pretty good, but they're not perfect. And what we really look for is the trend over time, okay? So, when you see someone's NEARs that had been, even if you put it on, you're like, oh, that's 50, that's not very good. But it stays at 50, and the kid's clinically doing well, that's probably okay. The bigger problem becomes if it starts at 50, and then drops. So why would your mixed venous sac go down? There's really only a couple, two things that are, that are happening. Okay? So your mixed venous, if you, have, you, you have to think about this like the I Love Lucy uh, phenomenon, the Lucille ball. Okay? So Lucy works at a factory. 
Okay. So Lucy sits at a conveyor belt, okay, she and she puts a, a Coke bottle on the line, okay? The Coke bottle goes down. Let's see she let's say she puts it on, it's full, okay? And then Ricky is Ricky, right? Yeah. So Ricky <laughs> is on the other end and he's picking them up on the far side, okay? And so in between there the conveyor belt is moving at a constant rate. That constant rate is your cardiac output. Mm -hmm. Okay? So if you know how many bottles that Lucy put on the conveyor, and you know how many Ricky was taking off, then you actually know what the cardiac output, the, the, the rate that the conveyor belt's moving. Okay, that's the principle. This is actually some, a principle called FIC, and this is how we do all of our calculations in the cath lab, FIC. So, if you think about how, if you have a certain amount at the beginning, and the conveyor belt is moving at the same speed, but now you have less bottles at the end, how is that possible, right? So either one, in that case, one of three things had to happen. In between there, that Ricky had to take off less bottles. Okay, does that make sense? Or he had to take more. off more bottles. Okay, so Ricky is what we call extraction. So when we talk about extraction, that's what Ricky is. Okay, so Ricky is the extractor. So normally, how do you change your extraction? So the things that we think about that increase your extraction are fever, seizures, things that increase your metabolic rate, so they're taking off, remember in our example, Coke bottles are oxygen, yeah. so are taking off more oxygen, and so the amount coming back to your heart is less. Okay. Things that decrease extraction, which would mean more oxygen at the, at the far end or on your nearest higher numbers, would be things like paralysis or a deep sedation. Okay. Usually extraction is a pretty fixed, when you're just sitting here, extraction is pretty fixed. Okay. So the amount of that Ricky is drinking or whatever is about the same. So. What are the other variables? The speed of the conveyor belt. So if Lucy keeps putting them on, and the conveyor belt starts going faster, how many bottles are going to be at the end? Less. So it's actually going to be, yeah, less, right? Yeah. So because now Ricky is going to, um, so so cardiac output has the same relationship with uh, with. Uh, um, so if your cardiac output goes up, oh, actually, I'm thinking it, it's the opposite way. So if your if cardiac output's going faster, right? And Ricky can only drink so many bottles, but the conveyor belt's moving faster. There's going to be more bottles at the end because Ricky couldn't take them off. Yeah. So your nearest number actually goes up. So people with high cardiac output, which is very atypical in our patients, but kids with like cerebral AVMs and things like that, those are the people that have high numbers because of that. The example you'll see in here is kids who are on ECMO that are dead, okay? Because your body doesn't extract right. anymore. Yeah. Okay, so that's like the, when the number really goes up, that's the bad sign. So when your cardiac output is really poor, conveyor belt's moving very slowly. Ricky's still drinking the same speed. At the end of the belt, there's going to be less bottles. Okay, so when we think about nears, when the number is going down, there's really two things that are happening. Either your cardiac output is going down, down, down. or your extraction is going up. up. Okay. So that's how we use those numbers to, that's kind of the dirty way to use those numbers. So you'll see Michael, you know, when he, when he he's very into numbers, as you know. Very into so the what, he'll, yeah. what he'll look at though, is he, he wants to see the trim in the mirrors. He sees the mirrors numbers going down. Now he's thinking to himself, something changed. So what's the next thing he's going to ask for? The gas, yeah. right? And why does he want to know the gas? What he's looking for is where is the deficit? Do I have a base deficit or a rising lactate? Signs that I'm having decreased end organ perfusion. That's worrisome, right? So yeah. if you now have decreased nears and you have signs of your lactate's going up, your base deficit's going up, you got a problem, okay? Versus someone who just comes out of the OR with the nears of 50, and you're like, hey, that's not very good, but lactates are low, no base deficit, just a number, okay? So that's why it's really the trend over time that, that's more useful than anything else. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. Awesome. That's nears in a nutshell. That's right. actually all I know. Awesome. <laughs> Any questions for Jeff? That was good. All right. You ready? Say say bye. <laughs>